Today I want to go over another key search algorithm in graph theory, breadth first search or BFS. Suppose you were given a graph with a starting vertex and asked the question of finding the shortest path from that vertex to every other vertex in the graph. The BFS algorithm allows you to answer this question. In this video, we will go over the key intuition behind this algorithm which will then lead us to an overview of the implementation of BFS. And in the last section of this video, we will go over a practical problem that shows one of the most interesting applications of BFS. Let's get started. One of my favorite ways to think about breadth first search is through the following analogy. Imagine a graph like this one represents balls with strings attached to them. Suppose you want to start a traversal of the graph from vertex 0. What you can do is imagine that you are pulling the ball that represents vertex 0 up until all the strings tighten. The shortest paths between vertex 0 and all other vertices are immediately clear and the levels of the graph visually show a natural order for breadth first search where we first visit vertex 0, visit all vertex 0's neighbors one by one, and then visit vertex 5. This was one of those visualizations that really helped the idea behind BFS click for me when I first learned this algorithm. Let's extend this intuition to a more complex graph. Starting at vertex 0, the idea of BFS search is that we are first going to visit a vertex and then visit all vertices of distance 1 from that vertex. After visiting all distance 1 vertices, we then continue with the natural progression and visit all distance 2 vertices. And this continues until we visit all vertices of the graph. Forcing an ordering where we visit all vertices closest in distance from that starting vertex is not only why the name of the algorithm makes sense, but also why it guarantees that the moment we visit a vertex, we have found the shortest path to that vertex. For example, the shortest path from vertex 0 to vertex 7 is discovered as soon as we visit vertex 7. As a result of this property for graphs with equal edge weights like this one, algorithms centered around breadth first search are the go-to method for solving shortest path problems. It's worth noting also that the order in which we visit vertices of the same distance from the start does not matter, so there are many valid BFS orderings. The BFS ordering shown here is one of those valid orders. Let's now take a look at the implementation for BFS. The BFS algorithm is quite similar to the iterative implementation of depth first search we went through in a previous video. We'll first initialize a boolean list that will help us keep track of vertices we have already visited in our traversal. Initially all vertices will have their respective marked value set to false. The key idea that is the core of BFS is that we will then use a queue to keep track of vertices that should be visited. While this queue is not empty, we will then remove a vertex from the front of the queue. If it hasn't been visited yet, we will visit the vertex, mark the vertex, and then iterate through all the neighbors and add any unmarked neighbors to the queue. To make sure this is clear, let's go through how the order is generated for this particular graph. Since we start at vertex 0, that's the first vertex into the queue which is then promptly removed, visited, and marked. This vertex is the first vertex in the BFS order. We then add all of vertex 0's neighbors into the queue, where the order in which they are inserted does not matter. The next vertex we then pop off is vertex 1 since it is at the front of the queue. This vertex is then visited and marked, making it the second vertex in the BFS order. We then iterate through all vertex 1's neighbors, of which only vertex 3 is added since it's the only neighbor that is unmarked. We then go back into a loop and pop off vertex 3 from the front of the queue. This vertex has not been visited yet, so we again visit and mark the vertex. As a result, vertex 3 becomes the third vertex in the BFS order. Going through vertex 3's neighbors, we add two more vertices to the queue, vertex 2 and vertex 4. We then remove the next vertex off the queue, which happens to be vertex 2. You know the drill now. Vertex 2 hasn't been visited, so we will visit the vertex and mark it, making it the fourth vertex in our BFS order. We iterate through all neighbors, but we don't add any of them to the queue since all neighbors have been visited. The next vertex that is removed from the queue is vertex 3, but this vertex has already been marked, so we move on. The same thing happens in the next iteration with vertex 2. 
We now have one remaining vertex in the queue, which is vertex 4. This vertex has not been visited before, so we visit and mark the vertex. This vertex is the final vertex in the BFS order, and after this point, the algorithm terminates since all of its neighbors have already been visited and the queue is now empty. Now that we've seen the implementation, let's take a look at a real world problem. Suppose we were given an image represented by a grid of pixel values. Let's assume that these pixel values are just integers for simplicity. We are then given a starting pixel location as a row and a column in the grid and a new pixel value p. Our goal is to transform all pixels connected to the starting pixel to a new pixel value. Let's deconstruct what's going on here. Given this set of pixel values, you can imagine a corresponding image where the value 1 represents the color white and 0 represents black. This is quite an oversimplification, but it's one we'll make for now so that we can focus on the important parts of the problem. With this image representation, it's a lot easier to understand the notion of connectivity as it relates to an image. Connected pixels share the same pixel value and have a path between them by moving either left, right, up, or down. So, looking at an example, given a location of row 2 and column 2, our starting pixel is the center of this image. Our new pixel value is 3, and again for simplification, let's assume this is some new color like blue. The goal of this problem is to transform all pixels that are connected to the center pixel to this new color as shown here. Here's another example to further clarify. If we choose the starting pixel to be row 2 and column 4, with pixel value 5 representing the color yellow, this is what the transform image looks like. For those of you who have ever used a paint application like Microsoft Paint, this is essentially what the bucket tool does to fill a section of your painting or drawing with a new color. Let's now see if we can try solve this problem, which is often referred to as the flood fill problem. Describing this problem as transforming a bunch of connected pixels should be an immediate signal that this could really underneath the hood be a graph problem. Also, the fact that, you know, this is a video about a graph algorithm, I suppose that could also be a bit of a giveaway. But in all seriousness, remember that connected pixels have the same value and are adjacent to each other in the left, right, upward, or downward direction. Suppose each pixel in this grid is represented by a vertex, and we take the idea of connected pixels literally and connect an edge between the two corresponding vertices. This is what the resulting graph looks like. And given the following input where we once again change the center pixel to a new pixel value, we can transform the pixels one by one by performing a breadth first search on the graph representation of the image. In fact, you could solve this with depth first search as well, either one works. I personally find the implementation using BFS a little bit more intuitive for this particular problem. Here's how we implement this solution. Our function takes an image, row, column, and a new pixel value. We first need to identify the starting pixel value since this will have a major impact on what pixels are connected to that pixel. And just like in standard BFS, we will initialize a queue with just the starting location as the first value in the queue. Since we will need to keep track of locations in the image we have already visited, let's keep track of visited pixel locations. After this, we follow the standard logic of BFS we just went through. While the queue is not empty, we remove the first element of the queue and mark it by adding it to the set of visited locations. We then transform the pixel from the old value to the new value. Then what we will do is take each row and column location from the neighbors of the current row and column location, and if that location has not been visited, we will add it to the queue. This is again following the standard BFS logic and at the end we'll return the transformed image. The only thing we have to figure out now is how to implement this neighbors function. Here's a few examples of how we expect the neighbors function to work. On this image, the center pixel has the following three distinct neighbors, whereas the edge pixel has the following two neighbors. This function is going to be a little tricky to implement since handling of the edge cases in the very literal sense has to be carefully done. We can first start by defining the four possible directions explicitly. Then we need to check that each index is a valid index of the grid and the value of that index is equal to the starting pixel value since that's one of our constraints for connectivity. Checking whether a pixel is valid is probably the most annoying part of this problem, but it can be done by making sure that both the row and column are non-negative, the row index is less than the total number of rows in the grid, and finally that the column index is less than the number of columns in the grid. 
and it turns out that's really the final piece of the implementation to flood fill. This is a problem I've seen asked quite often in interviews and people sometimes get tripped up because they don't realize that this is really just a graph problem in disguise. The biggest takeaway from this problem is that by looking at this problem from a graph algorithm perspective, it makes it so much easier and intuitive to implement. Sometimes the key to solving a challenging problem is just that clever shift in perspective. That's all for this video and thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the content, please hit the like button so that this content will be recommended to more people. If you want to see more content like this, please don't forget to hit the subscribe button. And if you want to more directly support the work of this channel, please check out the Patreon page linked in the description below. I'll see you all in the next video.